our lives. All right, let's go right into the word of God. I'm going to be speaking on something very powerful this morning. I've called it our redemption revealed. Your redemption revealed, my redemption revealed, or our redemption revealed. It is all about what redemption is. Now, before we go into reading scriptures to show you something very powerful today, I want to make this statement. You always hear me talk about knowing who you are in Christ, knowing who you are in Christ. And that is important because it is drawn from the encounter that I had with the Lord years ago when he revealed uh, uh, heaven to me, revealed hell to me, and then ministered that reality to me. I commissioned Pastor Victoria and I to go and teach the world, the believers, of our identity in Christ. Yes, that's true. You must know who you are. But listen to this. Before you can know who you are, you must first know who you were. Because if you don't know who you were, you won't know who you are. And then you may never actually know who you are to become. Because there is who you were, there is who you are, and then there is who you are to become. Very powerful. So before you know who you are, you must first know who you were. Because what you were has a lot to do with who you are. And then eventually, who you are to become. Now, we are going to really enjoy the word of God this morning. It's going to bless us. Uh, go with me quickly to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. In this very verse of scripture, I am using the New Living Standard. I didn't use that by usual uh, New King James. It, it, there's a reason for that. I will explain to you. Now, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true what is and sorry what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives that is the reason I'm using the New Living Standard I'm trying to bring it to the current day English language for a particular reason this very morning okay let's take it again all scriptures or the Word of God is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right and uses it to prepare and equip us, God's people, to do the very, every good work. So the word of God prepares us. The word of God corrects us. The word of God teaches us what is right and what is true. Very important. Take note of that verse of scripture. They go with me to the book of Psalm 119 and verse 105. Psalm 119 verse 105. Excuse me. <clears throat> 119 and verse 105. It says, Your word is a lamb unto my feet, a light on my pathway. Now watch it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says the word of God is inspired. It teaches us what is true, what is wrong. It tells us who we are and prepares us for the very good work we have to do. We come to Psalm 119 and verse number 105. It says the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. And then it is a light on our path. Which means our feet must locate the path of light. Light guides us, it illuminates, it eradicates, it, it, it chases away darkness. And in this context, darkness is not just the literal darkness we may talk about. It has to do with realms and levels of ignorance. Anything you do not know is, is a realm of ignorance for you. All right? Go with me now to Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 1 and 3. Very important. You listen to these scriptures we are reading tonight, uh, to this morning, and read it along with me. Are you ready? Read. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by their prophets. M long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God has spoken to our ancestors. In other words, the Jewish people. They are the ones that God revealed himself to and gave the Bible to. And through them, Jesus came. And through that, we are Christian believers today. 
So when the Bible talks about speaking to our fathers, it's not talking about your biological father. It's talking about your spiritual ancestry. Take note, your spiritual ancestry. What is your spiritual ancestry? Spiritually, we are Jews. We are spiritual Jews in this context because our spiritual ancestry goes back to Abraham. It starts from Abraham and down. Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. And we now come to a man like Moses and the rest of them and to David and the nation of Israel all through to when Jesus Christ was born. That is our spiritual ancestry. Now from Jesus Christ, we now talk about you. From Jesus Christ to you. Now between Jesus Christ and us, we talk about the apostles and the disciples. So those are our spiritual ancestry that the Bible is talking about here. Okay, verse number two. But in the last days, which is the time we live in now, he has spoken to us by his son. Watch it. God spoke, by, uh, spoke to our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors. But now he's speaking to us by his son, Jesus Christ. He's speaking by the word of God, speaking through the word of God to you and I today. And he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. Verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making a purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Talking again about Jesus Christ. He said that Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the reality of God. Jesus Christ is the personification. Jesus Christ is the essence of God. He has spoken to us through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the radiance. Now watch it. Why have I shown these three verses? I've shown you these three verses to help you understand that whatever we are going to be studying on this morning as we progress now, it is the reality of our redemption. First of all, it says the word of God is inspired. The word of God is profitable to teach us, profitable to instruct us, profitable to tell us the truth. So whatever we are reading, therefore, is the truth. Because it is inspired of God. It came from God. It is not the idea of a person. It is not the idea of Victor Phillips. It is the idea of God. That's what the Bible is saying. It is the idea of God. Because all scriptures, the word of God, was inspired by God and useful to teach. And to teach us in what is true and to make us realize what is true and what is not true. That is the word of God. And it comes again to verse number 3 of Hebrews 3, Hebrews 1 and 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. So what about Jesus has come to say to you and I is the truth. All right. I told you that I'm teaching on your redemption revealed. What does this really mean? Again. Until you know who you were, you can't know who you are. And then you may never know who you are to become. First of all, we were something else before we became who we are. And then there is something we are going to become. Very important. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Scripture, uh, the scripture says here, basically speaking, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is, so are we. I personally believe that the greatest miracle of life is not financial miracle. And it's not the healing of your body, as great as they may be. The greatest miracle of life and in life 
To me, we ever remain discovering who you are. Discovering that you are a child of God. Discovering that God is your father. And that the Lord Jesus Christ is your brother. And that the Holy Spirit is your helper, your comforter, your teacher. Who has come alongside to help you. And also remembering that you are a joint heir with Christ. Remembering that the angels of God have been assigned by God to watch over you. That right now where you are, the angels of God are with you. They are on an assignment in your life. God has entrusted your care, entrusted your protection to their responsibility. And the last time I checked, these holy angels of God are obedient to the word of God. They are obedient to God. And so they must carry out the assignment of God concerning your life that is entrusted to them. So I repeat myself, the greatest miracle in life is not the miracle of financial prosperity. It's not the miracle of the healing of your body. It is the miracle of knowing who you are, discovering your true identity. This is why it is important to know who you were. And then who you are, and of course, who you are to become. And that verse of scripture we just read in verse John 4 and 17 says, As Jesus is, so are we. That is benefit and revelation number one of your identity, of the mystery of redemption. As Jesus Christ is, so are we. Now, watch it. It is not how he was. But how he is right now. Now, how is Jesus right now? He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. And the Bible says he's seated in the heaven. He's seated at the, uh, by the right hand of the throne of God. And now the Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter number 2. That you and I are seated with him. In the heavenly places. We are seated with him. So wherever Jesus is. There we are. Whoever Jesus is. So we are. Whatever Jesus has, so we have. A mazugaba. Listen to the reality of your redemption. Your redemption revealed. Now, this is not my idea. This is why I showed you those first three verses we read in the Bible. In Timothy, in Hebrews, and in Sam. That you may understand that this is not Pastor Victor's idea. This is what I have discovered in scriptures. Like I mentioned to you, I was practically on my own when the Lord appeared to me and took me somewhere and showed me something and spoke to me. I have been privileged by him to, to have encounters with him, encounters with the Holy Spirit. I have been privileged by him to even see the enemy. And the defeat of the enemy, the reality of our redemption. So what I'm telling you now is not my design, it's not my idea. It is a responsibility entrusted to Faith Factor Ministries. And by reason of my being the leader here, of course, my responsibility to teach you the truth. Hallelujah. Watch this now. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 2, 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. The Bible says... He that knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus, our Redeemer, did not know sin. He did not commit sin. He did not become a sinner, but he became sin itself. That you and I may become saints. He became seen that we may become saints. He became accused that we may be justified. He died for you and I not to die. He went to hell that you and I not to go to hell. Our redemption revealed. The question now is this. If we have a picture of what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did in hell, what Jesus did at his resurrection, what Jesus did at his ascension, and what he will do when he returns back. What, therefore, are the benefits of this reality to you and I? Very important. Very important. The benefit is this, that you may rediscover your identity. 
you may rediscover who you are. The benefit is this, you may rediscover whose you are. And in consequence, you live your life the way it has been written by God in the Holy Scriptures concerning you and I. Now, the Bible, God's word, is a book of instructions. Again, it is like the manual that came with your television gadget through which you may be watching right now. Or that owner's manual that is in your car. Or any of those gadgets that you buy, they usually come with an instruction book. Now, you may encounter a situation in your vehicle or your gadget, whatever thing it is. I don't know how to resolve the issue, though the answer is actually written in your manual. The fact that your gadget has a problem doesn't mean that the manual didn't say the truth. The fact that you are able to resolve what will be going on with your gadget, like your television or your whatever set, electronic set, uh, uh, gadget you have, does not mean that the owner's manual do, does not reveal the truth of how to solve the issue. We are children of God. God is our Father, in spite of our experiences, in spite of what we may go through or what we have gone through. Just because you have gone through a challenging situation, a situation that has refused to, at the moment, to align itself, doesn't mean that you are not who God says you are. Doesn't mean the word of God is not true. Doesn't mean the Bible hasn't clearly explained to us. It could just be that we have not known the truth yet. This is where we have the assignment to stand as representative of God by his inspiration and revelation to bring this truth to you. So what is the essence of understanding your redemption? That you may know who you are. That you may also know whose you are. What is redemption? Redemption in its simplest sense is the concept of buying back. Buying back, taking back what was yours. In other words, in the scriptures, in the book of Genesis, chapter number three, as you look at the encounter of Adam, Eve, and a serpent or Satan in the Garden of Eden, right from that place and what they did in the Garden of Eden, they sold themselves to slavery. They sold themselves to sin. They became, unfortunately, followers of the devil. Consequently, anyone born by Adam and Eve became a victim. The moment you're born into this world, you are a victim. The moment you're born into this world, you basically just inherit the genes of Adam and the consequences of the Adamic life. So Satan became the ruler of mankind because he was ruler of Adam and Eve. So he became the ruler of humanity, the ruler of the world, the ruler of the earth. Every human being, right from Adam himself, all through, became victims. But God in his mercy, God by the power of his grace, planned our redemption. And by this redemption, it was to get us back from Satan. Remember the Bible declares the book of Ezekiel and many other scriptures in the Bible that the soul that sins shall die, whoever sins shall die. If you don't forget, in Romans chapter number 6, he's talking about the wages of sin being death. Romans chapter 3, rather. The wages of sin being death. Now the Bible says that Jesus had to take our place as though he was the one that committed a sin. That's what I read to you in 2 Corinthians 7 21. That he made him sin. He became sin. He that knew no sin. That we may become the righteousness of God in Christ. So Jesus gave himself in our place. He died in our place. And the full price... For our high treason was paid. By so doing, we were bought back. We were redeemed. <laughs> we were taken back to our Father, to our God, who is legally, by creation, by sustenance, and by spirituality, our Father, and our God, and our owner. That's how we were taken back. Now, we must understand what this means. 
This is why we are teaching on redemption revealed. Hallelujah. Watch it. The Bible says in that verse of scripture against 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, God literally imputed to him all that we were. All that we were. Until the very moment we turn to Christ, everything that we were, we are put on Christ. We are put on Jesus, our sins, the evil, the consequences, all of it, all that we were. Remember, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep, we have gone astray. So that's stray life, everything imputed to him, given to him, put on him, that he might impute to us his own righteousness. What happened? An exchange took place. We gave him all that we were, and he gave us all that he is. We gave him all that we were, and he gave us all that he is. Watch it. Ours is in the past. He is, is in the present continuous. We gave him all that we were. God took all that we were and gave it to him. He put it, put it to him. And God took all that he is and gave to us. So right now, like we have read in the first scripture we read now, sorry, like we have read in 1 John 4 and 17, as he is, so are we presently in this world. As he is, so are we presently in this world. As he is, so are we presently in this world. Are you listening to this? Watch it. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Romans 8 and 29. Romans 8 and 29. The Bible says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, who God knew, who God knew. Now, this is powerful. Remember, I told you, until you know who you were, you would know who you are and who you are potentially going to become. Now, the Bible says, whom God knew in the past. <laughs> Whom God knew. Such he also predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. That Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Revelation 1. You were foreknown by God. God knew you. I said God knew you. And God knows you. He knew you. Because he knew you and he knew his plans for your life. He knew his purposes for your destiny. And because according to John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God predestined you. He predestined us to be discovered. And to be recovered. That we may conform to the very nature, character of Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible calls the image. That we may become as he is. <laughs> that is what it means. Image. That we may become as he is. Amen. So you were, conf you, were, you were predestined to become as he is. So, if you are a born again child of God and you are filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit right now, right there where you are, as He is, so are you. Amen. You are predestined to put on the image. In other words, that when God sees you and I, He doesn't see us, He sees his redemption he sees he's redeemed he sees christ and the bible says christ in you the hope of glory christ in you the anointed this is why you need the holy spirit the anointed in you the anointed in you the hope of glory now let's keep reading watch it watch it watch it romans 8 and 29 for whom he foreknew say god foreknew me 
Say it right there at home. Say it for God. God for new me. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Listen, Revelation number two. We are to conform to the image of his son. So whenever God sees you and I, he sees his sons and daughters. Amen. <laughs> I love this. Whenever God looks at you, whenever God thinks about you, he's thinking about his son. He's thinking about his daughter. Now watch it. This is powerful. Uh, we have so much to go through today. I don't know if we are going to be able to do this. But just listen to this now. Watch it. Whenever God looks at you, he sees his son. Whenever God looks at you, he sees his daughter. He does not see a sinner. He does not see a black man. He does not see a white man. He does not see an Indian. He does not see an oriental person. He sees his son and he sees his daughter. He calls us his son. We are conformed to the image of his son. Listen, we are conformed to the image of his son. Hmm. Are you getting this now? We are conformed to the image of his son. So when God sees you, what do you think God sees? He sees his son. So forget about your skin color. Forget about what you may call your race. Forget about what you may call your career or your education. All those things are just there. But the reality is this. Whenever God sees you, he doesn't see a sinner. Can I even shock you? He doesn't see a Canadian. He does not see an African. He does not see an American, an Australian, a European, an Indian. He doesn't see any of these natural identities. He sees the image of his son. Ah, oh my God. He sees the image of his son. Now, let, let, let me try. I'm enjoying this so much. Let me try to, let me try to paint this portrait. <laughs> This is so powerful. Now, just for sake of simplicity, just imagine if you were to, if it were possible to put on, say, say Jesus Christ were physically present, and then you enter into him. <laughs> so when he takes his walk, it's not you that is walking. He's the one walking. When he speaks, it's not you that is speaking. He's the one speaking. Yet you are the one doing it on the inside. When he stands up somewhere, he's the one standing. When he goes out, people don't see Victor Phillips. They see Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you listening to me? Amen. Now that goes beyond imagination. It is more than imagination. Because that is the reality of scriptures. It says Christ in you. The hope of glory. But the, what, 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 is the, what is this now? It's not only Christ in you, you are also in Christ. Amen. So there is a divine exchange. We are in him, he is in us. I've taught you on this in, uh, in, in the book of John, chapter number 6, what I call the divine mingling, divine intermingling. We intermingled in John chapter 16, when it talks about the Holy Spirit coming to us. It is called divine intermingling. We are in him, he is in us. So when people look at you, whom do they see? You may be looking at yourself, but they are not seeing you. They are seeing Christ. Now, this is the promise of scripture. Remember the illustration I gave you about the owner's manual. It is right there in the owner's manual, but your TV is flicking. The computer is not running. You are not able to discover what is written by the manufacturer so that you may reboot or repair the situation with your, with your gadget. It doesn't mean the gadget is not correct. It doesn't mean the owner's manual lied. It only means that the one operating it does not know how to operate it properly. This is what is happening. In spite of what you feel, that is not who you are. God is in you. You are in God. You are a child of God. You have been redeemed already. So when Satan looks at you, he doesn't see you, Victor Phillips. He sees the son of God that defeated him on the cross of Calvary. That is the one that he sees. And I told you this before by revelation, that Satan does not know the difference between us and Jesus Christ until we open our mouth to speak. 
until he hears your voice and the words proceeding out of your mouth. He doesn't know if this is Jesus Christ or this is somebody else. But he knows what Jesus would say in every situation. He knows how Jesus would act in every situation. But then, he does the same, he brings the same trial, the same temptation, and we do not respond like Christ. We do not act as Christ. And then he says, Oh, is it you? I thought it was Christ. <laughs> So I thought it was Christ. I thought it was the Son of God. Friend, oh, you are redeemed. Amen. You are not a victim. Amen. You are not a victim. Now listen to this quickly. I want to say this quickly. Because I'm perceiving right now there is somebody who is in this connected for the first time. And you are not born again. You are connected for the first time. You are a girl, like 20 years old. You are connected for the first time and you are not born again. Listen to this. You don't have to be a 20 year old Christian believer. For this to be a reality. The very moment you got saved. The very moment you got saved. This became your reality. The very moment you got saved. This became who you are. The very moment you got saved. This became your reality. This became who you are. So you don't say wait a minute. Until I grow up. Then I will notice. No, no, no. The moment you are born again which I'm employing you to do right now, to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It becomes your identity. It becomes your reality. That's who you are. Hallelujah. I, I, I don't know why I'm hearing about Michigan. You, you may be watching from Michigan. I, you may be in Michigan and watching from Michigan. I'm hearing the word Michigan, Michigan. So maybe you're watching from Michigan and God is speaking to you right now. Hallelujah. So let's keep reading that verse of scripture again. Let's go on. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that Jesus might be the firstborn among lots of brothers and sisters. Revelation number three, Jesus is your brother. Amen. I am a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my elder brother. Not eldest. No, my elder. Because there is none between him and me. There is none between him and me. There is none between him and me. I am directly after him. I am directly connected to him. Hallelujah. I don't have older brothers or older uh, siblings. And I don't have younger siblings. Every child of God, connected to Jesus Christ, are the same level, the same length, the same distance, the same connection. So there is nobody between Jesus and you. The moment you got saved, Jesus became your elder brother. You became his junior brother or the younger brother. Hallelujah. That Jesus may be the firstborn among many. Revelation number four. You have many siblings. You have many brothers and sisters all over the world. So if you are a child of God, you are not lonely. You are not abandoned. You cannot be defeated. You can be connected this morning watching. And maybe your biological parents, biological siblings, biological whatever, or friends have abandoned you, turned against you. Because of your faith in Christ, hey, don't be part of about it. You have so many siblings. Billions of them, billions, billions, billions of them who are born again, tongue speaking, and going to the same heaven as you. And God is their father, and Jesus is their brother, and the Holy Spirit is their comforter. They are your siblings all over the world. Revelation, redemption revealed. This is who you are. Are you ready for this? Amen. Turn with me now. Holy Spirit is not very powerful. Very powerful. Oh, man, this is huge. In 2 Corinthians chapter 15. Or oh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe. Let, let, let me check. Let me confirm that. I wrote 2 Corinthians there, but I'm thinking it's 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15. And we're reading verse number 45. Yes, it's 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. 
1 Corinthians 15 and 45. It says, and so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Mm. Now, this statement of scripture debunks a lot of religious nonsense that is out there. This is, I'm just going to branch out a little bit and come back here. This is a certain religion that claims that they are the follower. In other words, they are the ones that Jesus sent. Jesus spoke about in the book of Luke 16 when he talks about sending the comforter to us. That religion claims that they are the ones that Jesus was talking about. And that it's not the Holy Spirit. It is their own leader who is belong dead. This scripture says here, watch it now. There is a last Adam. Not second Adam. No third Adam. But the last Adam. In other words, there is the first Adam that whom God created. That is the biological ancestors of every human being. But then there is the spiritual Adam. Which is the last Adam. That God also created Jesus Christ, who is the spiritual ancestor of every human being that gets born again. So when the Bible talks about the first and the last, it does not give room for the third. You can't go from first to last and then have room for third. No. So there is no third Adam. Neither was there a second Adam. We have the first Adam. And then the last Adam. But what is my key point here? Key point is this. He said the last Adam is the life-giving spirit. Mm. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. Can you, can you visualize this? You know, this, listen to this. You are redeemed. Amen. The life of God is in you. By reason of being born again, Jesus gave you life. So the spirit that is in you now is the indestructible spirit. The spirit in you now is indomitable. The spirit in you now is totally indefeatable. Amen. He is the life-giving spirit. So there is a spirit that gives life. That is the life, that is the one that Jesus gives. What Adam gave is not life. It ended. And it does end. But the one that Christ gives is indomitable, indefeatable, infatigable. The life that he gives, a life-giving spirit. So the life in you is the life of God. That's what the Bible says in Galatians chapter number 3. The life I live now. I live by the faith of the Son of God. He says, it's no longer I that lives. It's no longer I. It is no longer me living. What is living now is the life-giving spirit of God that is in me. Your redemption revealed. Amen. Friend, if you capture this truth I am teaching now, you will become drunk. I tell you the truth. You become drunk with expectation. Amen. You become drunk with hope. You become drunk with confidence. And now your confidence will be misunderstood as arrogance. Don't, just don't worry about that. Don't worry about what they think about you. Just be concerned about what God says about you. Amen. If you realize that the life in you cannot be destroyed... It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed. Why? Because the spirit is a life-giving spirit. He keeps giving the life. He didn't give it once when you got born again and ended. No. As long as that spirit is in you, he constantly gives you the life of God. The life of God. The life of God. The life of God keeps flowing from him to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. If you understand what I'm teaching, friend, this morning, you won't be afraid of any witches or wizards. You'll be afraid of sicknesses and diseases. You'll be afraid of lack. You'll be afraid of human beings. You can't be intimidated by what you hear or what you feel or what you see. No. Why? The life in you, 
the life-giving spirit in you is indomitable. It's indomitable. And, and besides, whoever is misbehaving towards you has long ago been defeated. And that's the devil. He has long ago been defeated. Like I always gladly say, except a battle was to ensue between Christ and the devil again, and the devil were to overcome Christ. That is only when you and I can be defeated. Amen. But the last time I checked, the last time I checked, Satan was defeated. And the next time I would check, Satan will still be defeated. The battle was once fought and ever won. And even if it had to be fought again, Jesus will win again. And every devil's in hell, all his agents and human agents and spiritual agents, every one of them put together under one name, they are still subject to the name of Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, Philippians 2. How God exalted him. How God magnified him. How God lifted up the name of Jesus. That at the mission of that name, every knee, every knee, even in heaven, even in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, in hell, they bow to Jesus Christ. Yes. Ah! Leho Soko. Worship him. Pray in the spirit for one second. Marema Gozo Pratalibaya. Zede, Zede, Zede. Aziki Kotaruna Masekete. Bele Sabro Malus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Listen to this on that revelation. Now write this down. I hope you're writing down. Write this down. The born again spirit, the born again spirit is from the last Adam. The born again spirit is from the last Adam. As long as you are born again, your ancestry is not to Adam and Eve. As long as you are a born again child of God, your ancestry is not towards Adam and Eve. Your ancestry is towards Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is your God. He is our Father. He is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. The born again spirit does not come from Adam. It comes from Jesus Christ. Okay. How do I know that? I will show you two verses of scriptures. First of all, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 is a very known scripture of the Bible. If any man is in Christ, if any woman is in Christ, if any boy is in Christ, if any girl is in Christ, whosoever is in Christ, ah, oh, mercy, God does. I love this open invite that Jesus gave to us in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 30. He says, come unto me, all you that labor, and a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Come to me. Jesus is speaking to you this morning and is asking you to come to him to find rest for your souls, to find rest for the troubled soul, your troubled life. He said, come to me. He said, lean on me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me. I will give you rest. The Bible says, yet, yeah, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He is a new creation. He is not, he will be a new creation. Not, he might be a new creation. The very moment you got saved, the very moment you believed in your heart, the very moment you confessed the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and your sins were forgiven, and you were adopted into the family of God by the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ, you became instantaneously a new creation, a new creation. In other words, God instantaneously recreated you. Woo! All old things, what you were. <laughs> What you were, what you were, all old things, what you were, what you were, all old things, what you were, till the very moment you accepted and confessed Christ with your mother, haven't believed in your heart, the very moment you said that, all old things, till that moment, what happened? They passed away. 
In the mind of God, they never happened. In the mind of God, they never existed. There are no records in heaven that you ever lived on the earth until that moment. There is no record of your good doing or evil doing until that moment. They no longer exist. Because listen, if you are not saved, even what you think you do that is good is wrong. Because good only comes from the good spirit. Good is only from God. Of what benefit to be your good to you if you are not believe, if you are not saved? We are going to be recompensed for the good things we do when we get to heaven with God. But if you are not saved, even your good on the earth is wasted. It's useless. There won't be any heavenly recompense for you. Because you are not going to the place where there will be the recompensation. If you are not going there, how are you going to receive it? You can't receive it. So even your good that you think you have done is wasted, is useless. Because all old things have passed away and behold. The word behold there means see. See. All things have become new. That very moment becomes your day number one. Hour number one. Minute number one. Second number one. That you began to live the life that God has for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. I said this before and I want to say it again. When you and I became Christian believers, born again, we can no longer legally be afflicted by the devil. Legally. He may still afflict, but it is illegal. He may still harass. Torment, but it is illegal. The moment you became born again, you can no longer legally be afflicted by the devil. The only right he had before that time was the right of transgression and the right of sin. But the moment redemption was set into motion and it is received by you, you are no longer a legal candidate of destruction. You are no longer a victim of the enemy. You may still be a target, but it is an illegal target. And everything that is illegal is subject to the word of God and can be brought down by the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. You are no longer legally in the camp of the enemy. You were translated into the family of God and God became your father. Watch it now. This is powerful. In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. He says, The spirit that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Now this is very important you understand this statement here. He talks about your mortal bodies. The, we have the mortal body and the immortal body. The word mortal means dead. It means something that can die. It's almost like a word from the French, mort, mortar. Something that can die. Are you listening to me now? But what is this saying here? Watch it. Very powerful. Now, this is a benefit on the earth here. This is not even not talking about heaven at the moment now. This blessing in verse 11 is on the earth. Watch it. He says, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead will give life even to your earthly body. Even to your earthly body. Even to your earthly body. In other words, you are totally immune Amen. from death. You are immune from sicknesses and diseases. You are immune. It is not our portion. Now, you may feel it, it is illegal. It is not because it is part of the covenant of God with you. No, 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 no. No, it's not part of the deal. There is a package of redemption. And the last time I checked, sickness is not part of it. Disease is not part of it. Death is not part of it. Poverty is not part of it. Confusion is not part of it. Every kind of despicable life is not part of it. The last time I checked, and the next time I will check, it will remain the same thing. Hallelujah. He said, it will give life to your mortal body. It will give life to your mortal bodies. So right now, in your mortal body, there is the quickening life of God. 
right now in your mortal bodies there is the quickening life of God inside ah. right now the quickening life of God is inside your mortal bodies Amen. right now right now hallelujah Amen. watch it Galatians 4 and 19 I'm trying to explain the challenge that we face Galatians 4 and 19 before we read like Galatians 4 and 19, let, let me say one more thing with, about that Second Corinthians, so Romans 8 and 11. What life is in you? It is, the, it is not a natural life. It's not a natural life. It is the Zoe life of God that Christ gives to us. C can I shock you? Christ did not come to give us natural life. We had natural life by nature. Jesus did not come to give you an unnatural life. We have natural life by nature. That's why even the unsaved is alive today. Am I, am I joking? No. You, you, know, you know people who are, who are not saved, but they are alive. They drive their cars. They live in their homes. They even fly private jets, but they are not alive. Spiritually speaking. So the life that Christ came to give us is not the natural life. He came to give us the spiritual life because he is a spirit being. He came to give us the spiritual life. But that spiritual life will quicken you as a child of God now. That in your body will be the supernatural life of God. Amen. Now, but why do we face the challenge we face? Remember, we are looking at redemption revealed. In Galatians 4 and 19, it says, My little children... Of whom I travail in birth until again, sorry, travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. The apostle Paul writing to the Galatian church, he called them my little children because, of course, just like you're watching this morning, you are my children in the Lord. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this now. You know, some time ago, I had talked about, you know, many of us were calling me Papa, 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 Papa. I just, I, I didn't kind of want to be called that way. You know, okay, now, listen, if you like call me Papa five times, that's fine. It's no longer a problem. It's, it wasn't a problem then. It is just, you know, I, okay, Jesus is Lord. Okay, you can call me Papa, just don't call me Pope. That's fine. Everything is fine. Hallelujah. All right. Now watch it. It says, my little children, just like you are, to me, you are my children in the Lord, of whom I travail in birth again. Stop one second. Why did Apostle Paul says, say, travail in birth again? Again, in birth again. You were first born again. That was a birth for you. But Apostle Paul says, again in birth. Because they, it's, it's like bringing this revelation to them was another process of delivering them. Okay. Because they could not at the moment understand the reality of redemption. So it was like going back to teach the basics of redemption to them. The basics of salvation to them. The basics of Christianity. So instead of him teaching the higher dimension of teachings, he was teaching the elementary teachings to them. That's why I called it again. He said, I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Until you understand the intricate reality of redemption. Amen. Until you perceive it. Until you appreciate it. Until you assimilate it. Until you begin to manifest it. Mm -hmm. Manifesting what? Christ in you. The hope of glory. The anointing in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> the anointing in you, the hope of glory. Friend, you are anointed. Amen. You are anointed. Amen. You are anointed. You have it. You have it by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God in, through baptism is living in you now. Living in you now. Stop thinking victim. Stop thinking incapabilities. Stop thinking weakness. Weakness. 
Stop looking for help. You are not helpless. You have been helped already. And our helper is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I explained to us on Friday what the word help means, or rather what deliverance means in the Hebrew. It includes salvation, includes help. So when Jesus came and died for you and I and shed his blood, we were helped. When the Holy Spirit came into our lives, we were helped. And we are still being helped and will forever be helped by the Holy Spirit. So we are not helpless. Amen. You are not helpless. You say, but pastor, I am having this challenge. You are not helpless. Your challenge does not equal being helpless. Your challenge does not equal being helpless. You say, pastor, you don't understand. We are calling it a challenge. It's actually more than a challenge. It's so serious. I agree with you. You are still not helpless. Because greater is he that is in you than the enemy outside of your life. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Amen. Watch it now. We are going to start enjoying scriptures more than we have already done. John chapter 17 and verse 10. John 17 and 10. Watch it. Oh. I wish I were in the church building where I can just run right now. Where I can just run. I don't have room to run here. John 17 and verse 10. Watch it. We are looking at redemption revealed. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Jesus speaking to the Father. Watch it. Father, all mine. Are yours, all yours, are mine, and I am glorified in them. So I am in them. My glory is in them. Mm. Pastor Danny, are you hearing this? Pastor Danny, are you can I hear you? All mine are yours. All yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. My glory is in them. And what is glory? All that I am, all that I have is glory. So all that I have and all that I am are in them. Our redemption revealed. All that Christ is, all that the Father is. Oh, Oh, all that the Father is, all that Jesus is, are in us right now. Amen. John chapter 17 and verse 10. And all mine are yours, and all and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Yes. 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 <sighs> Can you think about that, friend? Can you think, can you contemplate, can you visualize this reality? Can you visualize it? That all that God has, all that God is, are presently dwelling in you and I. Amen. Divine intermingling. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. Because God is tripartite. In other words, there are three parts. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all that the son has are, God, are the fathers. All that the father has are the sons. But the father and the son are in heaven. And so they sent the spirit to come. Their spirit, not just the spirit, but their spirit that is called the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us, to bring to us all that the Father has all that, ah, and all that the Son ah, has. Because the Son, the Father, and the Spirit are one and the same. Amen. All the Father has, all the Son has. But the Father and Son are in heaven and we are on the earth. But we must not be left comfortless. Ah, we must not be left unhelped. So the Father and the Son sent their spirit to come and indwell us with all that they have. That's it. 
John chapter 16, verse 5. John 16 and 5. Everything that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is mine and disclose it to you. Oh me 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 Everything that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is mine and disclose it to you. First Corinthians, we are going to blast off now. This is a blast of time. First Corinthians chapter 2, 21 to 23. You say, well, Pastor, you haven't blasted off before. No, I haven't yet. Now we are going to blast off. We're just preparing the aircraft since. Now we are about to take off. First Corinthians 3, 21 and to 23. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Watch it. Watch it. Powerful. Therefore, oh. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. First Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 21. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, that's Peter. Or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ. And Christ is God's. Hey. All things are ours, and we belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Everything is yours. He said, whether life or death, things present, things to come, everything belongs to you. Amen. Our redemption revealed. Yes. We were not redeemed to be shamed. That's right. We were not redeemed to be defeated. That's right. We were not redeemed to be put down. Listen, remember what I said from the beginning. Until you know who you were, you may never know who you are. That's right. And you may never even know who you are to become. That's right. You must first of all know who you are. Sorry, who you were. Then you will know who you are. And then potentially who you are to become. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 21. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter. Or the world, this world we live in, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Key, you must choose what you want. You must choose what you want. He said, Life is yours, even death is yours. You can choose. But I implore you, choose life. Amen. Choose victory. Yes. Because all things are yours. All things are yours. All things are yours. I, I used to say this to us at the church. There are many ways to go to heaven. Say, Pastor, what do you mean? I thought if we die and we go to heaven, that's not what I mean. I mean there are many ways you can live your life on the earth before you go to heaven. You can go the way of Lazarus in the Bible. Or you can go the way of Abraham in the Bible. Or you can go the way of the rich foolish man in the Bible. There are three ways, many ways to live this world. Lazarus believed the word of God. But he died. The rich man also believed the word of God. Sorry, he didn't, he didn't obey the word of God, he died. Abraham also believed the word of God and he died. So what way do you want to go? You want to go the way of Lazarus? You want to go the way of the foolish rich man? Or you want to go the way of Abraham? Now the Bible says, and Abraham was very rich. He was very rich. 
I don't read of any sickness in the life of Abraham. I don't read of any defeat in the life of Abraham. Even at about 100 years old, Abraham went to war with 300 soldiers. And rescued Lot, his nephew. And the things that were stolen by the seven kings. One man, old, went to war. He chose the way to go to heaven. But Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, in gold. And I call that Canadian dollar, American dollar, uh, uh, what's it called? Pound sterling, euro. He had all of it and he went to heaven. On the other hand, Lazarus was very poor and sickly. But he believed in God and he died. He also went to heaven. So do you want to die poor or you want to die blessed by God? The choice is yours. You want to die sickly or you want to die healthy and healthy before you go to heaven? The choice is yours. Because all things are yours. Every step you take, every word you speak, every tweet you tweet, every chatting you make, every conversation you have, all are yours. 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 All things are yours. You say, Pastor, is it wrong to be poor? Absolutely yes. It is an affront at the gospel to be poor. Poverty is not part of the package. Jesus did not die to leave us in poverty. He died that we may not be poor. It's part of the package of salvation. Oh, pastor, are you putting the truth? Read the Bible for yourself. When Lazarus got to heaven, where was he? At the bosom of Abraham. Abraham died with riches and he went to heaven. Lazarus died with poverty. He was in heaven, but he was at the bosom of Abraham. In other words, it's almost like he had no treasure stored up for him in heaven. Because he was not given to lay up treasure for himself in heaven. Are you listening to me? Poverty is not humility. Poverty is not humility. It's not humility. As a matter of fact, it is a function of ignorance. Certain things that have not been done that ought to have been done. Omissions. That's what results in poverty. Wealth are in different levels. Poverty also are in different levels. But that of Lazarus was so terrible. He was so poor that even dogs licked his wound. He was sickly. Also in the scriptures. Don't you read it in the Bible? Do you want to be like that? Is that humility? Is that the will of God? Does that glorify God? Let me ask you a question. If you are a parent, and God forbid it will never happen, but you're driving on the street one day, God forbid, and you see your child on the side of the road, tattered, in tattered penury, and a beggar looking for, uh, begging for arms with tattered clothes and sickly, and dogs are licking the body, licking the sores, and you are driving by in your car, and you see that child of yours that you raised up, are you going to go to church the next Sunday to give a testimony? Pastor say testimony time. You jump up. I have a testimony. I have a testimony. What is it, brother? You know, I was driving by the street and I saw my child. He was so poor and sickly and begging on the street. Oh, God is so wonderful. I give God a praise. Would you do that? No. no. If you were to see your child in that situation, would you cry out your eyes? Mm. You will cry out your eyes. You will literally look for the devil to strangle him. Then how do you think God is feeling when Jesus came to this earth to pay the price for our redemption? Poverty is totally unacceptable. It is not part of the covenant. Don't accept it. Poverty is not holiness. Poverty is not righteousness. Poverty is not humility. Otherwise, Abraham would not have gone to heaven in poverty with humility and righteousness. Abraham, in spite of his riches, went to heaven. So what do we learn? What takes you to heaven is neither riches nor poverty. But I would choose to go to Abraham's way. Because I would have laid up treasures in heaven for myself. By the good things I do on the earth with my riches. And I can use my wealth and riches to advance the kingdom of God. And to bless lots and lots of people. 
and help people and alleviate them from poverty to riches. Heal the sick. There are certain situations of life I tell you that don't require prayer. It just requires dollar. You say, yeah, yeah, that's true. Certain situations don't require prayer. If you meet a man that is hungry or food, and you have hundred dollars in your pocket, to be praying for that man is wickedness. You meet a person that is starving, hungry for food, food, and you have $100, even $20 in your pocket, to begin to speak in tongues for that man is wickedness. And at best, it is ignorance and arrogance. You take out a $20 and you give to the person. It doesn't require prayer. Let us not prayerize <laughs> everything. Hallelujah. So life is yours. Every breath you take, your heart beat, the chemical transactions in your body, your, 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 every day you live, the night you sleep, the movements you make, the words you speak, the relationship, the accomplishment, the plans, the emotion that rises, every thought that passes, books you read, every tweet, every test, every conversation, every gift given. And even every sin committed, all things are yours. Choose the right thing. Choose the right thing. Choose the right thing. The present is yours. Because the present is yours, the future is yours also. Remember the scripture we just read. Again, if you have forgotten, 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 23. All things, all things, all things, all things. Not some. All things are yours. But you will choose the right one for yourself. All things are yours. Listen, everything that is yours is serving you right now. Amen. Everything that was created was created to serve you. You will never achieve anything on the earth that was not always yours in God. Write it down. You will never achieve anything on the earth that was not always yours. That was not always yours. That was not always yours. You will never achieve anything on the earth. That was not always yours. I want to give you a simple example here. And please don't misunderstand it. Our daughter Zoe began to run years ago at elementary school. And she was showing interest in this. Well, I remember someday I said to her, how did you know you could run? And why did you begin to participate in running? She gave me the story. One day they had this uh, kind of exercise at school, elementary school. And she was looking at the people who were running. They were running, I don't know, 800 or 50, whatever they were doing. And the teacher, her teacher said to her, you can join them too. You can join them too. And she joined them in the race, and then she won the race on that day. Now, was it that day that the gift or the talent or the skill to run came from heaven? No. It was always in her. It was already in her. But she did not know. I did not know. Pastor Victoria did not know. But God knew it was already in her. Read the story of Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt didn't start sports running. He had a different desire. Forgotten what, whether it was soccer or something he was trying to do before. Until somebody told him, why not try running? And that thing today had made him, has made him a world figure, a public figure. And has made him a multi-millionaire. That thing was always in him. That thing was always in him. So you can never achieve on the earth right now anything that was not always yours. All things are always yours. They were always yours. They will always be yours. But we may never really achieve them. That is why you need to understand who you are and whose you are and the benefit of redemption. Are you still here with me? Amen. Friend, the future is yours. The future is yours. The future is yours. Not just the physical future here. The future that is called eternity belongs to you and I. All things are ours in Christ. All things. So we must choose life, therefore, that we may have life that God prepared for us. You must choose prosperity. 
You must choose soundness of mind. You must choose intelligence. You must choose holiness. You must choose purity. You must choose faith. Because all things are yours. Don't choose death. Don't choose poverty. Don't choose sicknesses. Don't choose depression. Don't choose fear. Don't choose defeat. No. All things are yours. But don't accept that. Amen. Only accept divine positive packages. Mm -hmm. Packages that will enhance your life. That will beautify your life. They, that will enable you to be a blessing to other people. Why? Because all things are yours. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Amen. Watch it now. This is very powerful. Let's read that verse of scripture again. First Corinthians 3, 21 to 22. For all things are yours. Whether Paul or, or Apollos or Cephas, that is Peter, or the world or life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. All are yours. I am insisting on this so that I can paint a portrait in your heart this day. So that you can examine yourself to see some happenings. If they do not correspond with the word of God, but they are happening in your life, you have the right to reject them. Amen. You have the right to discard them. You have the right to say no. It is like a courier service bringing a delivery to you, a package to you. And they bring that package by your door. You can look at it and say, no, this is not mine. I didn't order it. I didn't order flu. I didn't order a virus. I didn't order poverty. I didn't order sickness. I didn't order this quarrel or this fighting. I didn't order it. I didn't order this malice. I didn't order this animosity. I didn't order it. I refuse it. I won't accept you. I didn't order this marital crisis, this uh, uh, divorce, separation. I didn't order it. I didn't order this alcohol. I didn't order this drunkenness. I didn't order this abuse, this alcohol. I didn't order this drug. I won't accept you. You don't belong to me. I didn't order this delinquency. I won't accept it. I didn't order this weakness. I didn't order this arrogance and pride. I won't accept you. I didn't order this sin. I won't accept you. When a delivery is made, you have right to know if it is what you ordered or what you didn't order. And friend, I'm saying to you today, order life. Amen. And not anything that is contrary to the life of God. Now, I said all things belong to you are in Christ and Christ belongs to you. In closing, attempting to close. It's not a promise. In attempting to close. Watch it. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. Romans 8 and 9. Say, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ is not his. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ mm -hmm. is not his. Now, do you have the spirit of Christ? Hey, I do. Then you belong to Christ. And since you belong to Christ, everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. Since you belong to Christ. Okay, let me ask you the question again. Do you belong to Christ? Yes. That's your answer. And I agree with you. That means everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. What is? Watch it. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. Watch it. Very powerful. If you have the spirit... You are his. If you have the spirit, Galatians 3 and 2. If you have the spirit, you are his. So I ask you, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Galatians 3, 2. If you have the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, then you belong to him. Then you belong to Christ. Then you belong to God. Then he said, so I ask you, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Why am I adding that verse of scripture? To help you understand that what I have taught you today is received and manifested by belief. Received and manifested by faith. <laughs> Is received and manifested by belief. 
Belief cannot be belief except belief is accepted. You must accept it. Listen, everything you have ever experienced in life, good, bad, and the ugly, I must say this to you. Somewhere, somehow, they were accepted. They were accepted. They were accepted. Look at the testimony of our spiritual father. One of the testimonies he has given. Everybody knows this now. When he got married and his wife was pregnant with their first child, he was at work. And then she had a miscarriage. She saw blood. There was a miscarriage. And she went to the doctor while he was at work. And the doctor said to the woman, this is a miscarriage. Now was the baby in the womb is dead and is bleeding out. She returned home to wait for her husband. The husband returned back home and she told the husband what had happened. That there's a miscarriage. The baby is dead and is passing out by blood. What was his response to the woman? No, that cannot be. Give me my food to eat. No, that cannot be. Give me my food to eat. And they never had any further conversation regarding that blood, regarding the miscarriage. That supposed miscarriage is the senior pastor of the church of more than 400,000 people today. Was there blood? Yes. Were there blood? Yes. Was there a miscarriage situation? Yes. Biologically. But he refused to receive the package that was sent by the devil. He refused to accept the package that was sent by the devil. And that pregnancy, the guy is telling something now, a life with a master's degree, married with children, and the leading pastor of that church of about 400,000 people or more. Today. 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 Are you listening to me? A package was delivered, but the package was not accepted. He chose the right packages. I can go on and on with testimonies like that in our lives. You've heard it many times, all kinds of testimonies like that. By saying no to that which is unscriptural, but saying yes to that which is scriptural. And the just shall live by faith. So these things are not just heard. They are believed. They are accepted by faith that this is who you are it has nothing to do with what you are feeling if you go by feelings you will feel it you must go by sense spiritual sense which is called faith not what you feel hallelujah Amen. We do these things and we receive these things by faith. Again, Galatians 3, 2. If you have the spirit, you are his. So I ask you, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? I was speaking to the Galatian church. They started spiritually and they became fleshy and carnal. And said, who bewitched you? Verse 1. Who bewitched you foolish Galatians? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being matured in the flesh? Having started well, are you going to go wrong now? You have the spirit. How did you receive the spirit? Was it by behaving like fleshy, ignorant people? Or you believed it and received it by faith? So faith, therefore, is the key to manifesting this. Amen. Watch it now. Romans 8 and 16. And this spirit is not the spirit of slavery. Amen. This spirit is not a spirit of depression. It's not a spirit of bondage. It's not a spirit of fear. But of sonship. So, 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 we are not slaves to God. We are not slaves to God. We are sons and daughters. 
A slave has no inheritance. A slave has no right. A slave has no inheritance and a slave has no right. But we are sons and daughters of God. And this spirit is not a spirit of slavery, but of sonship. He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then hair, a hair of God and fellow hair with Christ. Ah. Fellow heads with Christ. Hallelujah. Fellow means I am a joint prince. Amen. I am a joint prince. I am a joint prince. We are joint princes and princesses of Christ. No one is higher than the other. I am a prince of Christ and you are a prince. And you are a sister, you are a princess. No one is higher than the other. No one is lower than the other one in the mind of God. But manifestation will be, may be different. Mm -hmm. Manifestation is the function of what we read in Galatians 3 and 2. Manifestation depends on how you believe it and how you respond to it. Watch it. Are you ready for this? Amen. Are you ready for this? Yes. Watch it now. In Matthew 17, 5, Matthew 17, 5, Christ is God's beloved. Because Christ is God's beloved, then you and I are God's beloved. Hebrews 1 and 3, we read it already before. Christ is God's radiance. Christ is God's essence, which means we are God's radiance. We are God's essence. Hebrews 1 and 2. Christ is God's hair. That means we are also God's hair. The word hair here means prince. Prince. Christ is the prince of God. So we are the prince of God. Amen. Christ is God's radiance and essence. So we are the radiance and the essence of God. Are you listening to me? Amen. These are scriptural realities. In, in 2 Corinthians 4, we read it before, you are Christ and Christ is God. Christ is God's son. Christ is God's word. And that word dwells in us. Therefore, we are of Christ. We are anointed. We are anointed by the word that dwells in us because Christ dwells in us. Uh, listen, I close with this statement right now. Make your boast in Christ. Make your boast in Christ, not in your insecurity, not in your fear, not in your doubt. Don't magnify your doubt. Don't magnify your fear. Don't magnify your insecurity. It is not a trophy that you are going to be given at the end of the race. Oh, you were so insecure, take this trophy. You were so fearful, take this trophy. You were so feeling defeated. Take this trophy. Nobody gives trophies to the defeated. Have you watched the video of the movie of life? Life on earth? Watch it. Two people, in uh, fact, five, nine, ten people will run a race, 100 meters. The camera will show all of them as they are running. When they get to the finish line, the camera is now focused on the man that won the gold. They will talk about the silver and the bronze, but the camera is focused on the, on, on, on the gold guy. That's life. So nobody gives a trophy. Nobody gives gold or silver or bronze to somebody else because they were insecure, because they were fearful, because they felt defeated, because they were weak. No, life does not follow such people. Life follows winners. Life follows winners. Life follows winners. And you know what? You are not about to win. You are already a winner. You are in the winner family. You were born a winner. The, the family of Christ is the winning family. And you were born into it. So winning is in your genes. Our DNA is that of the winner. We are winners. We are winners. We are champions. It is in our genes. Because the one that gave birth to us 
is the winner. So he couldn't pass to us the gene of the defeat or gene of the defeated. No. He passed down to us his genes, which is the winning gene, the victory gene, the success gene, the prosperous gene, the holy gene, the faithful gene, gene for eternity. That's what was passed down to you and I. Think it. Love it. And begin to live it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Let us pray. I need to talk to the Father this morning, telling him that you have heard his voice and that you have understood him and that you have made the decision today to live that life because all things are yours. Talk to him in prayer right now. Talk to him in prayer right now. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Maha do so prabagade elesito toruda braminga mambre te 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 lebe ze te parana malidas we worship your name we worship your name we worship your name we worship your name we adore you we are the winners we are the winners the winning family the indefeatable family we adore you and magnify you thank you thank you thank you thank you for redemption Redemption that is revealed, that we have come to see who we were, who we are, and who we potentially are manifesting already. Because as you are, so are we also. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah.